Okay, so good afternoon. My name is Stephanie and I'm going to be recording on some counseling models and interventions with regards to cognitive behavioral therapy. So I've shared my screen and I will start the presentation. Um, CBT is um, a basis that I use with my own personal counseling practice. So I do love it. I find that it definitely gets a lot of wonderful results with clients. And um, if it's not something that you um, have been using within your practice, I definitely encourage you to just check out a little bit more um, about the theory yourself. And um, look forward to hearing some thoughts and feedback about um, about CBT as we run through the presentation. So today I'm just going to do an introduction to CBT and review some of the models, the cognitive behavioral model. Um, we're going to be looking at the four factor model, which is an intervention that I have found to be very, very helpful for uh, clients to use. We'll be discussing a bit about the cognitive triad, um, some common cognitive distortions, um, looking at cognitive destructive uh, restructuring and how that is used as a part of the CBT intervention. And um, just again, some key concepts and limitations, some future areas for, resor um, for uh, research. And then at the end, I've included some resources for both clients and therapists. Um, CBT itself has, um, I guess, a history in stoicism. So I've put a few quotes just a couple um, throughout the presentation, but very little is needed to make a happy life. It's all within yourself and your way of thinking. And so this is a Roman Stoic philosopher. Um, so intro to CBT. Um, it's created by Aaron Beck in the 1960s and was influenced by both the behavioral theories and also um, the cognitive theories to come together to um, bring together a very powerful approach. Um, I think somewhat controversial in some, some areas and we'll kind of talk about that as we go along. Um, the basis of the theory, which I will kind of go back to a few times throughout the presentation, comes down to kind of challenging the thoughts that arise and we challenge those with evidence and use them to overcome some of the negative emotions or responses to the thoughts that we're having to help elicit different types of behavior. So emotional and behavioral reactions are strongly influenced by our cognitions and also the meanings and interpretations that we put to those arising thoughts and arising emotions. Um, and uh, some of the uh, factors that affect your emotions and behavioral incomes, we're going to dive into a little bit deeper. Um, some of these thoughts that arise are like your automatic thoughts, which are a little bit more surface level, a little bit easier to change and identify. Um, and then some of these underlying assumptions and then going a little deeper about some of the core beliefs you have of, you know, getting down to probably a lot of the common ones that come up of, you know, unworthiness or being unlovable, things like that. And then we're going to look at, again, some of this cognitive uh, distortions. So the cognitive behavioral theory model, so here it is again, we have like some situation or event that has occurred, and then we have a thought arises in the midst, I guess, of that situation um, that elicits some types of feelings and in some cases or in many cases, uh, some physical reactions. And then that leads to a particular behavior. So I have an example here and I've kind of shown two different pathways. So the same situation has occurred. A dog barks and we have two different people um, having two different thoughts. So the first person is thinking, oh, the dog's going to stop barking. He's so cute. Or the second person is a eliciting a little bit more anxiety, thinking the dog's going to jump on me. Dogs are very unpredictable. So then next, what's going to happen is that we're going to lead into feelings with regards to the initial thoughts. So person number one is uh, feeling happy. The dog is cute. They are a little bit excited. That's the physical reaction. And then the behavior that comes from that for person number one is she'll pet the dog and all as well. For the second person who was feeling a little bit of anxiety, afraid that the dog is going to jump on them and thinking that dogs are very unpredictable, they're going to feel more anxious and unhappy. Um, the physical reactions could be tension in their body um, and then they're going to try and avoid 
the dog. So that very objective situation, which I find um, often in therapy, I'm trying to help folks um, see that, um, just that occurrence, and then identify the thoughts, identify the feelings we're having and the behavior, and then how can we look at readjusting some of those thoughts that are occurring, again, to affect the pathway. So this is one intervention that I like. Um, um, in our resource list at the end, um, one of the books that I love, I, I have quite a few resources I go to for fun uh, metaphors, interventions, and worksheets, and this is from one of those guides. So unpacking the backpack, the four-factor model. So this has just helped to deconstruct some of those situations that arise. So the one we presented was with, uh, with the dog, right? So once unpacked, then the situation can feel a lot easier because we We've kind of identified the different um, areas of the um, of the situation. So unpacking what thoughts did I have, what feelings and physical reactions did I have, and what was the behavior, like just clearly laying out that pathway. And now when it's so clear, it's a little bit easier to pick out the pieces and um, you know see that it's possible to actually shift and create a different outcome. So that point of change is possible. Um, again, identifying the situation from a very objective point and sometimes it's hard because we have a lot of meanings and thoughts and perspectives on what has happened um, but breaking it down to that objective point it becomes um, a little bit more clear and a little bit more manageable so in that unpacked form for the client to be able to address it so then we can test and see is this thought that we have is there any alternative um, or the meaning that we've applied to it is there any alternative thoughts perspectives that are possible here how likely is it that the thought um, that you had arise is actually true is going to happen and then we can again kind of shift and apply new meaning so cognitive distortions i put here can you identify any thought patterns that you frequently use from this list um, or perhaps there's some clients that you are working with that are struggling with some of these um maybe you'll be able to pick some of them out i have found that um, once we're able to kind of separate the person from some of these thought patterns, like it's a separate entity, something that we can look at and identify, it becomes a lot easier to, um, to kind of work on it, to work with it, to help the client to change and have a different perspective um, or view on this thing that is not necessarily part of them, right? It's something that we can change. It's something that we can see a little differently. Um, and I've always found that when we get to the point uh, with clients when we're able to work on these cognitive distortions these thoughts arise and you're able to or they are able to say oh like this is me catastrophizing again or this is me using should statements again and then they can kind of find some grace and help to redirect um, the direction of their uh, um, feelings emotions and then that's of course their behavior so just a few all or nothing with that polarized thinking again over generalizing I find catastrophizing is one that's pretty common, um, should statements, blaming, personalization, and uh, the fallacies of fairness. So thinking that, you know, everything needs to be fair and just, and uh, kind of just breaking those things down. So again, maybe there's some here that you can identify within yourself. Um, another really important basis of the um, CBT theory is uh, Beck's cognitive triad. So um, CBT, which we'll continue to talk about, is very, people say it's like very mechanical, like it's a process, it's very skills based. And um, so there's been a lot of research, a lot of empirical evidence for um, its success. And so it's been used quite frequently in um, anxiety and depression. So um, according to Beck's cognitive theory, a crucial mechanism that facilitates depressive symptoms is a cognitive triad. So it's looking at your um, client's basically view. What are their views of themselves? What are their views of the world? And what are their views and perceptions of the future? Um, what's important to note in this cognitive triad and 
I don't know if it's to say it's a bit of a criticism, but it's just to kind of have an op open mind that these things are not necessarily um, completely independent of each other, but that there is a little bit of um, overlap in some cases. So I put that diagram just to keep that perspective in mind as you're working with your client. Um, so again, views of self, just presumptions of unworthiness, feeling unlovable, inadequacies, all co common stuff that I, I definitely find coming up with clients the views of the world um thinking that uh the world or just others or both in entirety is just unjust and unfair so maybe even falling into some of those um you know kind of like that the victim mentality in a case which doesn't necessarily leave them in a place of of power to change negative views of the future so just feeling hopelessness again so in relation to anxiety and depression right that feeling of hopeless hopelessness that things are not going to be able to change or shift shift for them um that the future consists of hardships and then their difficulties they're feeling now because everything is just hard um, are really going to remain and their situation will not change so next we want to have a look at um, some of these thoughts so um, automatic thoughts uh, i'm being boring people just think i'm stupid i'm a failure nobody likes me you know these are things that just kind of pop up naturally in response to quickly we'll say um, in response to different situations that they might be in um, very specific as it says they're on a higher level um more accessible like surface level i mean and so therefore a little bit more easier to identify and then to change when we get a little deeper so i do love to dig into core beliefs and statements i have like a lot of checklists that i like to give and work through with people and so we can kind of identify what are some of these assumptions that are leading to some of these thoughts we want to identify the the cognitive process that the client's going through so if people get to know me then they're going to find out that i am boring useless etc um, you know, and there's also sometimes a lot of heaviness and, and some of the stuff just comes from um, um, experiences in childhood for sure. Um, um, just meaning that we've given to different um, uh, situations and interactions over time, thinking that you're useless, uh, you know, not intelligent, whatever it might be. But then again, that falls down the deep, deep stuff is those core beliefs. And it's a lot harder to challenge some of those things because they're very true to the client that we're working with. Um, and again, it's a little bit more generalized statement, not so specific to um, the situations that are occurring, less accessible. And that's why I really love to work through the um, different work worksheets and checklists to dig some of that stuff out. Um, and uh, it comes out sometimes in, in really deep reflection and again had some really beautiful sessions with folks um as we unpack the meaning that they've attributed to some of the experiences they've had um, throughout their lives so the feeling wheel um i'm sure many of us use this i think it is a fabulous resource to help to identify on a deeper level um, some of the emotions and again just fleshing out stuff and unpacking is really helpful because we can kind of put our finger on some things and then utilize the skills and processes to be able to um, identify and redirect stuff so someone's feeling mad but on a deeper level you know they may be hurt <laughs> um uh, and on a deeper level just frustrated or irritated or whatever so so this is very very helpful um, so cognitive behavioral, so there is very much a behavioral aspect to it, of course. Um, and so um, I've done some interesting work through behavior modification. I think that's how I kind of found my way through to CBT and why it really resonated with me. So just looking at some of those more classical um, behavioral conditioning processes and pr principles to break down to help people create the pathways and steps to behavior change. On the next slide, I'm just gonna show um, a simple uh, homework that I, I use with some of my clients. Um, but uh, behavioral mechanisms, so just looking at the increase of adapted behavioral responses is gonna work through um, like practice practice and habituation, really getting people to look at it, getting rid of some of the maladaptive 
thought processes and responses that are coming up from, again, uh, thoughts, emotions, feelings, behaviors, yeah? Um, and also some of the learning, so uh, very skills-based, and then reinforcement of the adaptive responses that are coming up, the good behaviors that are helping to shift the client towards their goals. So I, I put it here again, thoughts impact your feelings, feelings impact your behavior. So if we can reframe some of the thoughts that are happening, we can change our feelings and then lead to different behavior outcomes, more adaptive uh, responses. So here is an example of a behavior mapping that I use with my clients. Um, again, uh, I, I included this in the resources at the end. Um, I just have these like packs <laughs> that I can go to when I see um, or, uh, kind of identify different skills that I want to work on with someone. So this is a pretty um, simple one. So we're going to basically identify that behavior that we're looking to change. And we know about kind of breaking things down into small, manageable pieces for a client. So what's the smallest step that we can take in the right direction? And then also encourage them and let them know that it's not going to happen all at once. But if we can start taking little, little steps all the way along, we're going to get there. A journey is made of many, many steps. And you can see that they give themselves a check mark or an X if they didn't complete the behavior. Um, and what is the small behavior and how can we build it and kind of move along the path to their success. So in this case, I will increase my well being by running, they wanted to get more active. Um, so this is the pathway that we followed. Um, this would be a worksheet I might use with people for like building self confidence, self efficacy, um, that sort of thing. Um, cognitive restructuring. So this is another intervention, which obviously um, is going to focus on changing that um, uh, that initial thought. So a cognitive therapeutical approach for coping with stress. So this anxiety and depression that we're dealing with is replacing the stress provoking or the irrational thought to something different, something that is more adaptive, something that is more helpful for them. Um, and helping the clients recognize and modify that inner dialogue that they're having within themselves, right? And then Again, something that's more positive, coping self statements. Um, it is certainly a collaborative approach. As much as in CBT, you have the position of being the teacher, the person who is, um, you know, helping them to work on their skills. I still highlight with all my clients that we have to work together. You've got to be willing to do the work and, and do the homework. We'll talk about some limitations there, um, but to be able to modify these, um, um, these, these thoughts over time definitely takes practice and then here again those autonomic thoughts underlying assumptions cognitive distortions that arise um, so the cognitive behavioral model again we looked at and um, I just wanted to show this if this wasn't two different people this could be one person looking at the objective situation of the dog barking and we can look at maybe shifting the um, anxiety um, inducing thought of being afraid that the dog is going to jump on me to maybe shifting and saying, well, how likely is it that the dog is going to bark on you? Where, uh, sorry, uh, the dog is going to jump on you. Um, where is the dog in the room? Can we make sure, you know, how can we kind of adapt this and break this down? Um, can we realize that the dog is barking, but the dog will stop barking? And, you know, is there anything you like about the dog? Can we look at some positives and then kind of shift? And then, it, you know, we can take a different pathway to a different behavior. Um, so just a few key concepts that I think are important or like little takeaways um, is that, again, in CBT, it is more of a teaching role. You are um, helping to identify in the process those adaptive, maybe versus maladaptive skills and reinforcing the positive behaviors and positive concepts um, and, and kind of going, uh, going along that way. Um, so in some cases, I know the outlook on CBT is that it's not so, or it is more, as I said, mechanical and not so focused on the therapeutic relationship, but more skills-based. Um, but again, I think for uh, for the process to really be helpful is to still take a collaborative approach between the therapist and the client in terms of goal setting and then also um, um, kind of identifying within themselves what some of those adaptive versus maladaptive thoughts might be, right? Uh, cognitions autonomic um, thoughts and, and whatnot. So um, homework is a huge piece because we want the 
client to practice the skill. So practice facilitates development and mastery of these skills to identify when those, um, you know, maladaptive thoughts or thinking patterns are arising and be able to, um, you know, shift before we lead to, uh, you know, the emotions and then the behavior. Um, it is very much focused in the present moment. So what are the current symptoms? And we're kind of um, focusing there. What are the current cognitions and, and, and that we're working with more in the moment as opposed to maybe unpacking stuff uh, really far back as maybe some of the other theoretical approaches might uh, more heavily weigh. Um, so consider, consider cultural adaptations. So um, as I mentioned, CBT, like stoicism is very much in western culture and western values and so a lot of the research as well has been focused in that area so i'm going to be discussing a little later about some cultural adaptations and considerations that we should take um cbt is also very goal oriented um, and I, I don't want to forget to mention that sometimes this homework piece, you want to also approach it with grace and understanding and support because we don't want the homework to make a client feel like they want to avoid coming to a session because they didn't do it or, you know, put some sort of negative meaning on their inability to complete homework, like they're letting us down or something. Um, so if someone has come to a session and they haven't completed their their homework piece then sometimes i'll just say well if you, you know i encourage you to do it because we want to practice the skills and reiterate how important it is but if if you're not able to get to it for whatever reason um well we can work through it together in the session I, we can still uncover and we can still practice and take away the themes um, but it is very oriented um the treatment plan can also tend to be a little bit shorter um some i've seen like six to eight as a typical treatment protocol some a little longer 10 to 20 of course the complexity of the client's um diagnosis and situation is going to come into hand we usually do like that 50 minutes to one hour session once per week um, severity of symptoms and the goal that we're working towards as well might um, mean we need to have, well, well, I should say, will affect the frequency of the appointments. So here's some interesting limitations to CBT. So one of them is going to be looking at um, irrational thinking patterns, uh, cognitive thinking that's popping up. We want to consider the basis of it. So in CBT, we're thinking if we change those thoughts, then we're going to kind of fix the symptoms and adjust the behavior. Um, however, if these symptoms are being caused by an underlying mental health disorder, something more complex, unless we really deal with that, then these um, irrational thinking cognitions are going to continue to arise. So cognitive, and that's just in relation to cognitive restructuring. So we might have to incorporate some other um, approaches, um, could be medication, whatever it is, to make sure that we are also addressing something else that might be impacting these um, thoughts that are arising. Homework compliance, as I discussed, is is definitely um, a limitation if it is not addressed, I would say. Um, if they're not able to effectively practice the skills and of you know going through the process, then some of the progress can be difficult. So that is something I stress at the beginning. But as I said, I really do try to extend grace so that it doesn't affect the therapeutic relationship because I do think <laughs> that's an important piece. And so that brings us here. CBT is highly structured and uh, sometimes it can be seen as being cold and very mechanistic. Um, it's you know, traditionally not so focused on the therapeutic relationship. But I do think um, this is an area that we can and should work on maintaining that therapeutic alliance when necessary or when 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 possible. Uh, behavioral component. So uh, in some cases they said, well, is the cognitive portion that, you know, that important if, if we're able to just focus on shifting the behaviors, let's say like behavior modification, maybe this is the actual active piece of the whole theory. Um, the other idea is oversimplification 
oversimplification of complex issues. So reframing to focus on positive or alternate perspectives when there actually may be a legitimate life problem or stressor that we need to um, approach. So I think this is also um, a great piece to keep in mind um, that, you know, what tools, resources, and strategies can we help to actually address some of these legitimate things that are coming up in stressors? And, um, you know, like maybe the dog may actually bite you because for these different reasons. So what can we do to um, address that? Just thinking about that model that we uh, explored earlier. So cultural considerations, I do think is, um, is a limitation due to the basis of it. Um, and some studies are showing that it does have limited effectiveness in minority countries. There's also a lower amount of engagement of it says ethnic minority participants in some of the trials. So the use of CBT is lower in high and middle income countries. So I do think this is also an area for future research. Um, on the next slide here, I kind of came up with some ideas and some points of cultural considerations and how we can adapt some CBT interventions. In a previous course, I wrote about um, how I would adapt a traditional CBT model for an African American um, uh, woman and broke down some of the different thoughts and um, you know underlying assumptions that she may have faced that we just need to consider um, in the process of CBT. So um, I think this chart is very helpful because we are considering um, the different impacts of different cultures might have. So I think immigration or it says migratory stressors is a big piece to consider. Um, we also think about how religion can impact some of our core beliefs and views and perspectives, the view of self, others in the world where Western culture maybe is more individualized and others is a lot more community and these things can kind of mesh together a little bit more. So based on cultural concepts, it says collective or individualistic. So that's, that's that piece. Um, some of these un helpful assumptions, um, meaning of symptoms in relation to cultural beliefs, norms, and values, um, and just, you know, you'll see different triggers. And so I think that this um, chart is very, very helpful. I, I put a couple of notes on the side. It's an evidence-based, pragmatic, collaborative theory. Um, we, again, are looking at the importance of cognitions, emotions, and behaviors um, while maintaining the core CBT techniques. The fundamental principles of CBT are based on engagement, working together. And then um, this piece of distrust, I think, was really important because there is stigma um, um, in seeking help and seeking therapy in, in different cultures. Um, and again, some of the beliefs, religion may play a part in it. Um, racism can be something that's very difficult for certain cultures to even discuss in the first place, you know, and again, that level of, or that concern or issue of trust arises within the relationship. So also setting an environment. So these are some things that we can consider to adapt the traditional, um, uh, principles and processes of CBT. So almost done here, uh, talking about CBT counseling considerations. So again, it's very evidence-based, it's highly empirically supported, it's widely studied, and um, I think that's great. Due to its structure and process, it may be beneficial to adapt CBT interventions to include more of a person-centered approach. Uh, again, talked about uh, really working on identifying ways of highlighting the importance of the therapeutic relationship, right? CBT involves active participation from the client. So homework, journaling, that behavior mapping, active scheduling, problem solving, answering questions. And I think all of these things are really important and can get uh, more progress with, a, I think, a stronger therapeutic relationship as well. Um, we also wanna consider that the things that we are applying are developmentally appropriate. So I think that's another um, important piece to consider, culturally um, appropriate and then developmentally appropriate. Research suggests for CBT to be successfully implemented, the patient must be willing to do the work and have a generally optimistic view of the therapy itself as well. So I like to encourage folks to know that this is a well-studied, process it you know has great um empirical evidence and so really to believe that doing the work is going to help to create good results um, include relapse prevention so know that things uh, are going to happen we're going to make mistakes we're going to fall off the wagon um 
and uh, be there with the client and let them know that that doesn't mean that we've failed. We can still make progress. We can still work towards where we're wanting to go. So I think it's important to identify those barriers that might come up and then some strategies for success. The third wave of CBT, I love that, getting into some more mindfulness-based relaxation training and looking at different ways of reducing some of the physiological responses that um, folks are experiencing, progressive muscle relaxation, imagery, beautiful stuff. So these are some things that we can add in. Um, some resources for clients. I went right to the Beck Institute. So there's a page they have, Beck Institute Cares. And there's a lot of different resources, as you can see here, books, tools, videos, um, some focus here you see on weight management and also a blog. I highlighted for us as therapists, the Beck Institute actually has great resources and certification available as well. And I've included the website there. Um, um, our ebooks are some of our um, course uh, books earlier throughout the course. I've put a couple of them there because there are clinician guides I've gone back to for um, workbooks and uh, homework assignments. Positive psychology is a place where I get a lot of those um, those work packs of homework to do. And then we also have observing CBT therapists in action. Todd Grande is someone that um, I found a lot earlier on, again, I think through some of our coursework. And he's very interesting to watch. It's great to see uh, people model the use of, um, you know, that teaching role and uh, the implement implementation of the skills. So thank you very much. Again, I'm Stephanie. This is my email address. I look forward to your feedback. Here's another little quote here. Man conquers the world by conquering himself. And I think that's really what we're working on through, um, through our CBT. So thank you very much.